the first thing that I'm going to do is introduce to you the uh, planning board members. Uh, starting at my uh, extreme left is uh, Vaughn Dugan, sitting next to uh, Vaughn um, Peter. Peter, what's your last name? Goodwin. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, folks, uh, every now and then. Um, sitting next to Peter is uh, Mike Cotter, and then to my right, John Thurston. Next to John, uh, Brad Harriman, who is the uh, selectman representative to the Board of Selectmen, and uh, Julie Jacobs, who is a, an alternate. Uh, Julie, Susan Replier is not going to be here, so would, would you be willing to be the uh, sit as a planning board member? Yes, I will. Thank you. Okay, uh, there are uh, two public hearings, and let me read the first one uh, into the record, but before I do that, let me just uh, explain that uh, with these public hearings, uh, what we do is first hear from the applicant, and the applicant will go over the reasons that he is here, uh, how he uh, complies with the zoning regulations, and any other relevant information. Uh, after he does that, planning board members can, can ask questions, and uh, then I'll check with uh, Tavis Austin, who is our planning director, uh, who uh, may or may not have some comments that he wants to make. Uh, we then need to determine if there are waivers to, to um, grant. If there are, we need to vote on that. Uh, once the waiver issue is resolved, then we need to vote to accept the application as complete. Uh, once we do that, then the public has an opportunity to speak to um, the, the issue. So, uh, the first, first item, uh, Kent and Nicole Hanfield. This is a boundary line adjustment. Uh, two lots at Beach Pond Road. This is a tax map 054-013-012 and 013. Uh, this is case number 2021-18. Uh, okay, uh, good evening. If you can give us your name, that would be great. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, my name is Ray Bisson from Stonewall Surveying. I am representing the Hanfields. So my, uh, as you had stated where the properties was. Um, <laughs> well, right now they currently own 18-12 and 18-13. Both of those lots were subdivided back in 2000. They are in the process of looking to place their house on the lot, and when they were out there, they kind of noticed that the best place to put the house is kind of right where the property line existing runs through the lot. So what they would like to do is they would like to adjust the lot so that way the area that I have shown here in yellow would be conveyed from from 18-13 to 18-12. And that is approximately 2.64 acres. Um, currently, there's an existing woods road that runs from Beach Pond Road through both lots. And that's gonna be, that's kind of used by both lots currently. Um, they will put a deeded easement for both lots to continue using that as opposed to developing Two, two driveways um, out there. Um, test pits have been conducted on both lots, so the soils do perk for the, for the systems. We do have a proposed system shown here. That's for the house. And we have down over here is another test pit that was dug that shows that that lot can support a system. Neither one of these lots need the um, Hampshire DES subdivision approval as they both exceed five acres. 
We are asking for a waiver on Article 174-7C for ground control. Um, all the monuments have been recovered on the property. Uh, only surveying has been done out on the rear in this area. Um, at this point, and we will set new monuments for the proposed line. Any questions? Okay, so uh, this reconfiguration of the lots, um, and can you speak to the issue that it does, uh, it is an overall improvement of the lot? Uh, because we have to make that finding. Yeah, it's, it's definitely an improvement because it's gonna create a really nice lot out back as opposed to having two lots, two houses kind of back in this area going to make for one nice lot and this one still has a, a buildable area that's suitable there it's very large it's still 7.6 acres it, it meets your form factor um, of being under 35 it's at 30.79 okay so it still meets that criteria as well okay all right thank you The, I can point out that the best view in where they want to put the house is this basically white box. And that's basically the best view going out to seeing Lake Wentworth. Right from up there, you can actually see the lake right now. And that's kind of why they're putting the house positioned over there. Okay. All right. Uh, questions? And the issue is that you want to maintain that view? over a period of time so that you can cut down anything which is uh, which grows up in the way? Yeah, the... The other, the other reason when you're talking about how this makes for a better lot, this is a very steep lot back mm -hmm. here. There really isn't that much of a buildable area in these areas because of how steep it is. And then from here, going back, it, it drops off quite a bit. So utilizing this as the buildable area for one lot makes a lot more sense than trying to put two houses back in here. This has already been cleared. It was cleared a few years back. Um, so yes, they would just kind of maintain any tree growth in that area for their view. Okay, go ahead, Mike. Um, Madam Chairman, I'd be happy to make a motion to approve the re request for a waiver from subdivision regs 174-7C for ground control. Okay, does somebody want to second that motion? Second. Okay, thank you. It's uh, really not applicable in this case. Uh, the requirement is four points located on the ground for allowing for easy orientation on the ground, and we don't really have any reason to go out there and orient ourselves, so I don't think it's really appropriate. Okay, uh, there's a motion and second on the floor. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, uh, all right. Uh, with that, does anybody have any other questions have before we motion. accept this? Motion to accept is complete. Okay. And I'll second that. Um, so the motion has been made and seconded to accept this application as complete. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, now I'm going to open the public hearing, but thank, thank you. Sure. Okay, this is an, an opportunity for any member of the public that is interested in speaking on this application uh, to do so at this particular time. So if you're interested, come on up. If not, okay. Um, I don't see anybody coming forward, so uh, any other questions? Two questions? Yep. Um, on the lot, there are three conservation easements noted for wetlands. Can you speak to who is the monitor for those conservation easements? Who? The easements are in, but to the benefit of to whom? I mean, I'm not aware of who the entity would be. I would believe it would be the association who owns the whole, like a 30, or it's a 
71 acre piece of open space behind. So of the open space, and I would assume that whoever has the, the rights to maintain the open space would have the right to monitor any of the wetlands. Okay, so you're assuming that the, the association back behind these two lots are the monitors for the conservation easements, and they're the ones to whom the easement had been... Right, and that made. would have been all created in 2000 subdivision. Okay, thank you. And then one last question, Madam Chairman. Mm -hmm. um, you speak about easements on the Woods Road. Um, both lots are owned by the same owner, are they? Currently they are, yes. And so you can't give an easement to yourself. Correct. So presumably the easements you're speaking about will be given to whoever buys Correct. the other lot. Right. So okay. basically that's kind of noted on the plan that it would be a proposed driveway easement, but it would have to be done when they would actually sell that first lot. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Minister. Okay, okay. Any other questions? Go ahead, Don. Uh, uh, what's the proposed width for the driveway easement? The driveway itself is 14 feet, but um, let me just see if not a 30 foot wide is what I had on the plan. And I think that was what was called for out in the 2000 plan as well. Anything else? So that should be adequate for all utilities to go through there, like overhead utilities. Uh, Tavis, do you have some uh, conditions for us to consider? Excuse me. Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, is, is that wide enough for Barry to do his overhead utilities, 30 feet? I would imagine so, yes. I mean, you can fit two-way traffic in two 12-foot lanes, which would be 24 feet, so 30 should be more than adequate. Oh, okay, did... did Recommended conditions I have uh, reference the plan set that you have in front of you as the plans to be approved should the board so act. Uh, applicant does need to submit a mylar for recording at Carroll County Registry of Deeds and all documentation submitted in the packet um, and whichever is the most specific should be the controlling document. And then lastly, the applicant should be responsible for monumentation and updated plans to be stamped by a licensed land surveyor. Uh, landscape architect, certified wetland scientist, and professional engineer as applicable before recordation. So this is standard five conditions. Okay, and would there be a bond required for this? Not typically, no. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, you've heard the, the uh, conditions. Uh, what's the pleasure of the board? Be happy to make a motion to approve. Okay, motion has been made to approve this. Seconded. And seconded. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, th thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next application, uh, Goodyear Hawkins Real Property, LLC. This is a site plan review uh, for boat trail storage area at 121 Filter Bed Road, tax map 190-026, case 2021-18. Uh, and uh, you all set? I believe so. Uh, good evening. Uh, for the record, I'm Jim Rines from White Mountain Survey and Engineering, uh, here representing Goodhue Hawkins Real Property LLC in their request for a site plan review to approve uh, an area to store the uh, boat trailers on their boat storage property. Um, if any of you have been down there, uh, there's 
trailers up and down along filter bed road and the idea is to take the area that was basically sort of a lay down area and storage pile that's directly across the street from the uh, existing boat storage building so just to orient the, the, the board and the audience here's the the boat storage building filter bed road Pine Hill Road is out here, and this green square right here represents this green square here. So here's the entrance to uh, their current uh, boat area. Over here you have uh, the existing conditions. This is the tree line. There's kind of a flattened area where they had lay down when they were doing construction. There's a few stockpiles and so they want to uh, formalize this into a gravel uh, area where they can get the park uh, get the boat trailers off of uh, filter bed road and and onto here um, because we're going to be regrading it um, we disturb uh, more than 20,000 square feet so we needed to adhere to the uh, stormwater management regulations in the town of Wolfboro so we are proposing a um, bioretention basin here, a detention basin here, a couple of level lip spreaders with some grass swales coming around. Uh, the post-development runoff is less than the pre-development runoff in all instances, but the uh, two-year storm where it was a hundredth of a CFS higher. Um, the trailers will be empty. There'll be no boats on them. The, the parking area won't be plowed in the winter. This is just, uh, I've, I've learned you know, going through this process with them that they sell a boat with a trailer and then if they store the people's trailer, their boats just get left there. I mean, the, the trailers get left there. They don't, people often don't even use their trailers again once they buy them. So it's a, it's created a problem. Uh, the property is at 121 Filter Bed Road, tax map 190, lot 26. Um, we have requested a waiver uh, from section 175-15E4Q, which is for buildings, wells, leach fields within 150 feet of the property. And uh, I'll just go back to this for a second. So you can see that this is in here. This is Wolfboro uh, Tuftonboro Land Bank property, uh, and there's a large wetland complex that comes down through here. Uh, there's really, it's not near anybody, and uh, we felt that the 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 uh, effort to try and find all of the leach fields and wells and buildings within 150 feet of that property was going to be a, a yeoman's task, and didn't think that that effort would be commensurate with the benefit that the board would have by having this information felt that both the public and the board could understand this application with without that information and we hope that uh, you would agree and with that i would be happy to answer any questions that the board or the public has um happy to make a motion regarding the waiver if the board has had a chance mm -hmm. to discuss to consider that I'd be happy I'd be happy to move that the board approve a waiver from 175-15 E4Q okay someone you want to second that I'll second it uh, okay, uh, everyone in, in favor of the motion to uh, grant the waiver, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, about how many trailers do you think are going to go in here, Jim? Um, as many as they can fit. <laughs> Not to be smart, but I, yeah. I, it's, you know, Brent had looked at actually uh, having a, a, a structure manufactured that they could actually you know set them in with a forklift to try and store more of them but the structure was going to be like a hundred thousand dollars 
So this uh, area is um, it's about 90 feet across, um, and they'll just be putting them in just as tight as they can. I, I honestly can't. I, I'd be misleading you guys if I gave you a number, but you know they're going to fit in as many as they can. Go ahead, Davis. Are there going to be more trailers stored there than boats can be stored in the building across the street? No. Uh, no. Okay. So go, go ahead, Mike. Uh, further question regarding waivers. Question for the, the planner. You got my email. Um, does the applicant not have to request a waiver from the parking rigs for site plan review in this case, even though he's obviously not going to be parking cars there but there are parking regs in site plan review which have to be met well the, there are parking regs that have to be met as part of site plan review in this particular case it would be parking based on the warehouse use it would have a much different parking calculation than a boat storage facility that's fine so i didn't look at this as an enlargement or an expansion of the use rather a correction of an omission from the prior site plan approval you did not you did not look at this i, do, I do not believe it needs a waiver a change or an expansion correct all right so you don't recommend that we need to request a waiver from 17321c parking rigs for site plan review in this case i do not okay thank you uh, okay and what about the um uh, filter bed road the width, I mean, if, if that were to be uh, at some point in time turn into a town road in the future, yeah, so uh, I, is I, there I, enough width here? Yeah, I, I spoke with uh, Brent after the TRC uh, because the direction from the TRC was if anything else were to be done beyond this, they'd probably want to see a, a platted right of way, and he's in support of that. Uh, if that's something that uh, they want to do in the future, uh, he's on board with it. And I, I looked. I, I know uh, Mike had had posed a question about access, and and there are easements that have been granted uh, through both the Taylor Home property and the the Wara property to this to this property uh, that were granted by both Wara and um, the Wolfboro Tuftonboro Land Bank as they conveyed the parcels. And I, I have that information here if the board wants that for their records. No, it's just, sorry. Yeah, I think it would be helpful to have it, wouldn't it? Well, it, it may be helpful to have it. I'm assuming, and I know there's danger in assuming, but I would assume that the board would have required memorialization of that before the building permit was issued. Right. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to get to the building. Um, as to the right of way, um, in m my opinion, the proposed parking lot is not substantial enough a change to the site to require the right of way dedication with this project. But the suggestion at TRC was to make sure or ask Jim while pondering, is there enough room between the existing improvements on one side of the ethereal filter bed in this project? And the answer was in the affirmative. So should something else occur later on this parcel or further out, um, I think the owner's well aware and the surveyor of record is well aware that that's likely coming with a suitable project. Um, it's a lot of work to actually mark out the right of way and put together the legal description and all of that. And right now, there isn't anyone to dedicate it to. Um, but the fact that development is occurring on both sides of a future road um, is sufficient, for, in my opinion. And the, the mylar that gets recorded memorializing site plan approval, should we get there tonight, will show future filter bed road location that effectively is a future street map for this parcel, at least. OK, but at least we know that it has come up and been discussed. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, John, did you have a question? Yeah. So, uh, at what point are screening requirements enacted here? Because this is obviously going to be uh, not very favorable uh, viewing area when you are going to build a town road and you're going to go up by there. Are we, are we having other applicants who create parking areas 
that require them to have trees and landscaping and we're, we're not, not fitting that in? Uh, oddly, if you look at the regulations, they are proposing the correct number of trees for the parking area and it's surrounded by woods. Um, staff looked at it, or I looked at it more to the tune of, well, could the planning board require a condition of approval that imposed screening along the future filter bed road? Heaven forbid we put it in the wrong place because then someone is going to be relocating the screening in the future or redefining where filter bed road would go given where um, the screening location would be. And because in my mind, it would be landscape screening, not a fence. Putting a bunch of metal trailers behind a cyclone fence doesn't really improve anything, in my opinion. Um, Personally, I was looking at this as a victory, trying to figure out at the same time how to write a violation letter to Goodhue and Hawkins for parking trailers all up and down filter bed road in a really haphazard manner. So this is a solution without a, a prompt. Um, it, it's the balancing act. So, that's so I, my understanding is that there are two trees proposed. Yeah, there, there are two trees and then some shrubs in here. How did that spot get picked and not along the road? Uh, no, there, there isn't anything. This, this is all wide open now. It's, it's internal to their property lines. So there's, you know, they don't have to screen from themselves. It, you know, John's point is valid if there, if there were a town road, but this is, you know, this is all of this is their property. They own the fee of filter bed road. Um, so they'd be putting up fencing and screening from themselves, even though the public does make use of it, obviously, for running and biking and walking and things. But I think, as, as Tavis said, it's, it's going to be an improvement over the existing situation. And if they go to do something further, you know, they, they've expressed the willingness, you know, they want to work with the town, they'll grant a right of way, they'll, I, th I think they've shown uh, good intent through their projects to try and do the right thing. Okay. Uh, th thank you. Okay. I, uh, oh. I have a real issue um, with the uh, contour map that you have for the final grading in that it, it is very, very difficult for me to see the comparison, as in it turns out that the retention pond uh, in, in the center of it has a 570, which is above the level of the, uh, the trailer area. And then when you end up looking at something it says uh, that is now going to be 558.6, and, okay, that ends up to me saying that that is a depression. Correct. But it is exceedingly hard for me to look at the dotted lines versus the solid lines to understand what you're doing. And my brain really had a hard time going around that. It looks like it's all fine. Yeah. But it is a very hard thing for me to understand. I, I, I apologize. I don't know what I can do to, you know, the... The industry standard is you show the existing contours dashed and you show proposed solid. Well, so, I, I would suggest that I am not industry. And so it might be that you would add an extra piece here which talks about the final thing. I mean, I understand that what this is the industry standard says, but it to me is very, very difficult to understand that. And uh, it, it looks fine to me. Yep. As when I look at it, but it's very hard for me to get my mind around it. And I'm, you know, I, I do contours. Um, I know what contours look like. Yep. And, and so it's not that I am, I think, naive in that, but it just, it's very, very hard to figure out. And then there's the berm down to the southeast or southwest, and it takes a hard time, a long time for me to understand how tall that berm is relative to the area which is just to the east of it. And so I just, I, you know, it looks fine, but it is very difficult for me to understand it from my point of view. Uh, I will try to make that clearer in future applications. Sometimes just a cut and fill diagram helps. Yeah, or, you know, an actual 
proposed a, a plan with only proposed contours and one with existing, I guess. Okay, uh, go ahead. Um, on the plan proposed site plan, you show snow storage areas, but you don't intend to plow. The client does not intend to plow. Correct. Um, presumably, those snow storage areas in some future date could be planted with some stuff to kind of screen the gravel lot and the trailers so that if filter bed road ever did become anything other than what it is now, there would be some screening there possible. Yes, I, I, I mean, I'm sure that that is, that is a possibility for the future, absolutely. Okay. You know, they, I mean, they do plow up to the boat storage building now. So there, and, and presumably when a road goes through, they'll be plowing that road. So there will be, there will be snow, certainly, you know, on the sides of the road. So uh, that's, so the snow storage that is shown on the plan currently will be you or could be used when they store the snow that they plow off of filter bed road to get to their boat storage facility? That yeah, I think the there could be, I think there could be plantings, you know, in the future, sure. Okay. Um, on, I notice on your, I'm going to revisit filter bed road again, because I'd like to get this into the record for some future date. On your plan, you show the course of filter bed road um, in, in both plans. You don't show a width of filter bed road. Um, is that because you are unaware of the width of filter bed road, or is it because it's not necessary in this case? I mean, it's not necessary in this case. There, there was a res there was a 50-foot reservation for the easements through the Taylor property and through the Wara property. Mm -hmm. There is no specified width through this portion of the uh, the uh, Goodhue property, but when it gets up up to here, there is a a 60-foot width uh, from from this point to this point to go out through uh, the property that goes in that direction but but through here from the, from this point to this point there's no specified width okay thank you Jim okay uh, I'm going to open the uh, public hearing okay Okay, if there's any member of the public that wants to speak to this application, uh, please come up to the acceptance microphone and uh, let us know we, what your issues are. Do we need to have the acceptance complete? Oh, oh I thought we did. Yeah. I'm sorry. So yeah. Move to, to accept the application as complete. Okay, and I'll second it. All, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, okay. Uh, is there any member of the public that wanted to speak to this? Okay, uh, Tavis, do you have some conditions? Very general conditions recommended. Uh, first, refers to the plan set that you all have in your packet. Second, refers to the applicant submitting a mylar uh, for recordation. And number three, applicant responsible for recordation fees. Uh, and the fourth condition is the ubiquitous um, condition talking about uh, the most stringent within the plan and record becoming the controlling document. Um, applicant mentioned, or applicant representative mentioned a couple of things tonight that I did not make as conditions, but I wanted to bring up in case the board wanted to add them. Um, such as, applicant shall not be permitted to store boats on trailers in this area, be trailer parking only. And the other, um, sort of came to mind when we were talking about the hypothetical number of boats, somewhere between none and as many as possible. Um, I don't know if the board wants to... Business decision. Yeah. Well, I'm torn. The board could easily put together a motion that say the number of trailers stored there shall not be greater than the number of boats housed at any one time or available to be housed across the street in the storage facility. How, how would that be fair, Tavis? It's not, because frankly, I'm all for Goodhue being willing to store as many trailers as possible here, as opposed to further populating Wolfboro with trailer parking locations. Then why don't we forget that, that, that potential condition? 
I'd like to refer, if I may, Madam Chairwoman, to um, the applicant's agent's letter of August 17, <coughs> the third paragraph. I'd like to pick up uh, two statements in that paragraph <clears throat> and turn them into conditions of approval. Um, the first one being in the second sentence, this area will be a gravel area and will only be used for storage of empty boat trailers. That picks up Tavis's condition. And second, the area will not be lighted, signed, or plowed in the winter, and there will be no litter storage in this area. I'd like to make that also a condition of approval. Okay. <laughs> and the reason those weren't added in the recommended conditions of approval is because they are part of the application but by making them conditions, it becomes very clear and succinct in the notice of decision that they're furthering what they said they were going to do. Exactly. Um, if, if one trailer is left on that lot, does that mean they're not in compliance during the winter? And if it's there in January, is that something we need no, to? No, they, they can leave the trailers all year round if they want, they just can't plow there. And I, I believe the applicant agent even said that the trailers might be left there over the winter time because clients buy boats, get a trailer, don't care about it, and just, just get stored. So but what happens if the person wants to sell a trailer in February? He goes to go to Hugh Horkins and they try to figure out how to get it out from underneath two or three feet <laughs> worth of snow. That's I, I, I think from a practical standpoint, if said trailer happened to be there under five feet of snow when somebody wanted to purchase that trailer, I think Goodyear would have every reasonable opportunity to go in and get that trailer. I think yeah. the idea is that it's not routinely plowed every snow event, you know, keeps the salt down, keeps the plowing down, keeps the disturbance down, and it becomes a trailer lot. Because this is a gravel, will be a gravel lot, I would not want to see that plowed in the winter time, pick up gravel and move it into the retention basins and cancel the purpose of the stormwater management system. So there's oh. just those two additional. Okay, all right. I, I have one, one, one point of interest. So when Jim described the property as uh, through and through and then described the width of the road and said that there was no screening needed because the property was all con con uh, continuity, uh, all in continuity. Why? Uh, what's the width of the area of the road that we're asking them to buffer from? They're, they're not. There is no road. That's the point. Putting a, a, a screening requirement in there would be effectively saying, I want you to buffer this side of the planning board table from that side of the planning board table. It's all. The table. There's nothing to screen it from. There's no public access to the property. Yeah, it's not, it's not a public road. I understand. So I'm just trying to say, uh, what was the problem if they were storing the trailers all up and down the road, but it was in all their property through and through in the first place? That's because the trailer storage wasn't part of the original approval. The original approval was very discreet. There's a building, there's an asphalt apron, and then there just became trailers everywhere. Okay, maybe the public will understand that also. Go ahead, Jim. I, I, I can also add that Brent just didn't like the sight of it. It, it, was, <laughs> it was, made him unhappy to see his site in that condition. So that's, that was the, that was the okay. primary that, driver. That was the driving force. Yes. Yeah, oh, okay. So that's six conditions then. Uh, okay, so uh, does anyone have any uh, concerns about the added conditions? Okay. Move to approve. Okay. Second uh, motion has been made and seconded to approve this applications with the conditions just indicated. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? O okay. Th thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, the, the next item on the agenda is a... Uh, uh, several several items, but uh, are you folks here for a certain reason? Uh, uh, okay, that was, um, yeah, do you want to talk about Patty Cook's? 
Uh, what, what, and so that's what you're here for? Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, okay, so why don't we uh, just jump ahead to uh, the uh, letter that I sent to you from Patty Cook, and, I, and this was a, a while back. <clears throat> Um, so, many of you will probably recall that shortly after I was hired, I received a forwarded email from uh, the Cooks asking about the real estate agency. Um, are they lighted signs? Are they lights, etc.? cetera? Um, and the lighting committee got together, as you're well aware, and came up with certain recommended changes to the lighting regulations in the town, and that was discussed at the last workshop session and next steps for that. One of the, I'll say, tangential questions for the lighting committee to consider was, well, what are the lights that you can see at the real estate office? Are they signs? Are they not signs? So the recommendation that came out of that committee was that the, the illuminated elements inside a structure should not be regulated by the planning board. Um, Related to so effectively if somebody were to have a refrigerator store and leave all the refrigerators open so you could see the light outside It's functionally the same thing um, Technically they meet the definition of a sign because they're displaying prima facie what it is that that Store sells in that case the particular store is a real estate office and they sell real estate and Instead of putting all the houses inside they show pictures of houses that are for sale with some details about them um, the question then became the illumination and the lighting subcommittee uh, did not believe that the planning board needed to get into how bright the interior of a store was. Um, so to address that particular email, there was a recommended change to the sign regulations removing a particular definition that happened to be a catch-all. Um, catch-all such that if you were to put a radio flyer wagon for sale in a toy store and put it in the front window and put a light on it, the accessory sign definition captured the radio flyer. So now technically you'd need a sign permit to put a radio flyer wagon for sale in a toy store. And the general consensus was that was the same thing that the real estate office was doing, was put a light on something inside the store that was for sale. So uh, my recommendation to the board, as it was at the last workshop session, is to bring that revised sign ordinance language to the next workshop for consideration by the board. Uh, and then you can decide whether to put it on for the town warrant or not. Okay, is this something that should go to the sign committee or? No. That's up, that's up to the board. To me, I think the board, I the mean, planning board can handle it without. I, I, you, you need to enforce this, so, you know, what would be the best thing for us to do? I the, need to enforce what? Uh, the issues that, that she brought up in her letter. I'm, I'm just trying to find out if there are some things that we should do with our regulations and to address some of these. Is the answer no or yes? That's, well, that's, what, that's the suggestion that will come forward at the workshop. Um, I can look for it briefly right now if I can find it, see what the recommendation was that came out of the lighting committee. That came out of, of which, the lighting committee? The lighting committee is where it came up because originally the lighting committee was spending a lot of time discussing the real estate lights okay. that were the source of the email. So from the lighting committee perspective, the way I understood the last aspect was that we were going to uh, get similar situations from other uh, communities like ours, uh, some on the coast, some in Maine on the small communities that everybody was using these and we were going to find out how they were defining their use. And so I think that's how the committee left it to have us. Okay, so. Yes, and the, the short answer of that is most communities do not regulate them as signs because they're interior lights. They technically are not lighted signs. So that that's 
the answer to to Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Cook, right? That continues to be the answer to that question, yes. So to okay. the comment about having a workshop on whether we would revise the language, are there some variety of different languages we could discuss? Well, there was recommended language that came out of the lighting committee, and I can add to those language that other communities use if the board would like to bring that to the workshop, yes. Be worth looking at, I think, to see what other communi communities use for language to address that issue. But I want the board to understand, once you start playing with this piece of paper in the regulation, you also unravel this piece of paper. So right now, it's the body of sign regulations where it's a very simple change to address it. If we start adopting very specific language, it might become a bit broader change to the sign regulations. And then I would go back to Kathy's point, yes, the sign committee needs to get involved. Yeah, my, I'm, I'm a little bit reluctant to go that far. What, according to my notes, back in August, we had a final draft from the subcommittee for the lighting regulations. Uh, the board discussed them. We liked what we saw, and we left it at that. I'd hate to reopen the whole can of worms now that we're in September with a, not a lot of time between now and when we have to propose a warrant article for public hearing to redo the lighting regulations that we have already, a sign committee has already come up with, sign regulations, um, and the strength of one objection to one series of displays downtown. I don't particularly like the displays downtown either, but I tend to agree with Tavis that they're not subject to our current regulation. Well, where you just went is where the lighting committee went. The material that is available for display are displays. They are not signs. Yeah. There currently is a sign definition, and that is what would come back to the work session or could come back to the work session with a very minor change to the sign regulations that would button it all up. Is that what you're recommending? Yes, that's what I'm recommending. I'll go with that then. That, that you're recommending what? I'm sorry. It would be a change to the lighting, reg or the, sorry, the sign regulations. So it would not, I just want the board to hear, we're not going to be changing the lighting recommendations that the board has already reviewed mm -hmm. and asked to come back, but there'd be a, a related, but not immediately related revision to the sign regulations. And that's what I'll bring to you at your next work session. Okay, and what about John's comment or uh, similar situations from other communities? Did we, did we do that? Yes, in, co in combination with what John said and Vaughn said, I will look for other communities and how they address these elements. So we're going to do this at a work session of the planning board, not of the sign committee? My suggestion is the planning board look at it en masse, if you will, and then mm -hmm. if you, it warrants further deep dive, we can invoke the sign committee. That sounds okay. good. Okay, all right, thank, thank you. So I don't know if that helped you folks or, or not, but. <laughs> oh. Oh. Yeah. Express my opinion of that and offer that I feel that it's a slippery slope um, that as these things take hold, you never know where they lead to. Mm -hmm. So I ask the board, even though I don't have a solution of any kind, uh, to consider to the extent they can, or whomever has the opportunity to take a look at that, uh, that you really give some consideration to the, uh, uh, the compromised integrity of our beautiful hometown and what's happening in the center drive through there in the evening hours and those extremely bright black lit signs are just spewing all of that light all across the uh, sidewalk and whatnot. To me, not in keeping. Bright light, is that an issue? And the other thing that I would end up saying is that in some ways things inside of stores are not things that you see as you're walking down streets. They're there when you're window shopping. And I would suggest that uh, you walk past Blacks, 
Um, and you can see things in the windows, and that's one thing. And then you have to say the real estate brokers, if they reduce their, their lumens on those signs by a factor of two, is that okay? Um, you know, I, anyway, so it's a, it, as suggested, it's a slippery slope. But to, well, regu to, to regulate it is a very difficult thing. It, I would suggest that an equally slippery slope is the board stepping inside a building, which is not something that is really addressed by site plan review. Um, I mean, my Brighton, Vaughn's Brighton, Peter's Brighton, Mike's Bright might all be bright or different variations of bright or dim. Um, I mean, the, the lighting regulations do speak to not being harmful light. It can't be dangerous. Yeah, if it were so bright that anyone driving down Main Street saw the light coming out of the real estate office and swerved into the post office, that would clearly be outside the limits of the regulation. Um, for some, it's the color of the light as well as the intensity of the light. But again, um, there are the town has very limited control over the inside of a building. We have control over use. We have control over exterior lighting signs um, to go into the sign discussion a little bit more the question is are, are these illuminated elements signs mm -hmm. well by definition they are showing what is for sale but the sign regulations are very clear is it a wall sign is it a freestanding sign is it a projecting sign all of those are no is it a window sign no so then the question becomes how because a window sign has to be permanently attached to a window or in Wolfboro etched into the glass. These are not, they're suspended inside the glass. So the question that was generally talked about, how far inside the glass should the regulations go before it's a sign? Well, and, and Anecdotally, I ran into a situation where this came up in another community. It was a store that happened to sell baseball bats. And the allegation was they're exceeding their window, total window signage allotment. And the argument that was made is each one of the bats said Louisville Slugger. That community said the sign ordinance goes 18 inches inside the glass. So the committee very quickly talked about, well, is it 18 inches, is it 12 inches? Frankly, who's going to measure it? And then the solution was the planning board doesn't step inside the glass. If it's not in or on the glass, it's an interior display and the board doesn't have jurisdiction. So, yeah, go ahead. So, yes. um, in lighting, we do go a long way into the spillover onto adjacent properties. I mean, I wonder if we can look at it this way. It's spilling out onto the street. It's, it's only disruptive because it's coming into the public way. It could remain in the building, which would be hard to do. Um, then it would seem just to be something in the shop. But once that light penetrates the glass and comes out onto the road, it's in the public way. So, you know, we make people have down lights so that it doesn't spill, maybe something like that. We require exterior lights to be down lights. Not interior. Not interior lights. Because there are, no, you could go round and round with this. I will come back with some further reading material at the workshop. Okay, all right. Okay, so we'll be discussing this. Two weeks. In two, two weeks, okay, all right. Thank you. Okay, then uh, for the next items, I wanted to switch things around and have the Abenaki Trail discussion uh, because Tavis has a PowerPoint he wants to share with us. Well, I have a, a PDF of a PowerPoint, so I'll, um, I'm going to start out by saying there are 33 slides. Don't let that scare you because most of it we're going to gloss over. The, so if you will, I didn't print this out because it's 33 pages. The idea behind putting this master plan together, um, frankly, is there are a number of people in town that have spoken to me about putting in trails. Harriman Hill came in and asked about putting in a trail. The Wolfboro single track, mountain bikers, everybody and their brother seems to be very interested in putting in trails. One of the things that the regulations um, 
Interestingly, one of the things that the regulations makes rather difficult to do in town is to put in a trail, primarily when there's land that involves wetlands. So we have private land that may want trails, we have town land that may want trails, we have private land with conservation easements on them that may want trails. And all of these groups seem to want trails that cross these various ownership types. But any time it's not on town property, the regulations require a special use permit for every wetland interaction, whether it be open water, wetland buffer, et cetera. That process in and of itself can be more cost expensive, more cost, more expensive and time consuming than actually building the trail. So one of the thoughts was, dear Abenaki, we're looking at doing some trail updates well, now we're flying. Now we're jumping ahead. So what they did is they started out um, looking at Abenaki as a potential test case, if you will. So it's town-owned property, town trails, et cetera. And the idea is if a reasonable presentation can be made, <coughs> which combines the town's interest, need, mission, here's excerpts from the master plan, Speaking of the importance of multimodal transportation, interconnectivity between projects, connecting neighborhoods, connecting corridors, connecting open space corridors, things of that. And we look at the demographics. And then we look at how wonderful Wolfboro is. I'm, I'm skipping through, right? Good, good, good. So we have the existing Abenaki Trail network, and there's the Sewell Woods Trail network, and then there's the NIC. And many people said, well, why don't these connect? One of the reasons is money, the other is wetlands and the permitting process. So starting with Abenaki, looking at a five-year phased approach, we can talk about this in more detail at the workshop. I realize many of us cannot read all the words on the screen. Come up with, oh, if we're losing it. It's really hard to see, but there's all the existing trails at Abenaki. There's the conceptual Abenaki bike park, and in the background you also see this, the ski trails. The yellow line that runs around the bottom is actually a shuttle route that would allow you to be driven to the top so that the downhill people can do the downhill thing without having to pedal uphill. So we started going through all of these various pieces, and then they looked at how to connect Abenaki with other corridors within town. We're going to get to the important part for the planning board in a minute. The idea is if they were to follow the basic design guidelines on decommissioning trails, opening trails, and things of that sort, so it was very clear what was open, and they were able to document and come up with the best management practices approach. Could we conceivably come up with a policy for allowing trails, maybe it's all trails, maybe it's public trails, maybe it's all public-private trails that are available to the public, multi-use or otherwise, uh, that as long as you comply with a certain set of design standards, you don't need to go to the planning board for every wetland crossing. That's really the takeaway from this. So they're looking at protecting slopes, they're looking at protecting resources, minimizing still? erosion, and then here's how you cross a wetland or boggy area. Uh, would you still need to go to the state? What's that? Would you still need to go to the state? Depends on how it's done. The short, the short answer is if you put in a bridge and you go from top of bank to top of bank, say crossing Willie Brook, that is not a state wetland fill permit or dredge and fill permit. So the, the other way of answering that is any state permit may still apply, but that may be the only permit that is required. And what they're showing is a way to build the trails. Uh, the bottom right picture is an example. No one is actually proposing that, to my knowledge, in Wolfboro right now. That's a much different type of trail. And here's the technical spec. So the question would be on a bridge or a, a wetland span, do the columns actually require a permit, or the vertical posts, if you will? And that is something that would have to be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, Obviously, it depends on what you're crossing, what you're spanning, what weight you're trying to hold. Who, you know, is it pedestrian only? Is it pedestrian and bike? 
multi-purpose. Um, and they've also even factored in um, accessibility needs or ADA needs on certain trails and surfaces. Um, so that's a free trail master plan that a very interested <laughs> group of people put together. Um, and I'm happy to discuss it in more detail at the work session, but I did want to get general feedback from the board on the concept as to whether the board would be amenable to allowing staff level or um, similar in lieu of a special use permit. Um, the simple trail that Harriman Hill was looking at from the residential units down to the state road that essentially traverse the same line that the sewer lateral follows involves two wetland crossings. Yeah. That's two public hearings, or at least one public hearing for two crossings in front of this oh, board. So, um, Did they take into account emergency services, say if somebody gets hurt out there? Yes. They get the little track it, it's, vehicle in there and it's a... It, yes, and they've actually geolocated all of the reference locations so that the responders know where to get to. So if somebody somebody calls in from a certain area, they know what road to what station, et cetera. So uh, I'm gonna broach a sticky subject. So if you create a bike trail out in that neck of the woods, would you free up the Bridge Falls path and make it a walkers only path so walkers weren't uh, affected by the constant biking and, and how that comes together. I, I, I'd let the board fight with itself on that. Yeah. This, this idea was only to broach the subject of the wetland crossings. Okay. John, yeah. I, think, I think it would free up a lot of it, but I see a lot of it every day, and it's not going to free up those people that go half a mile. It's not going to free them up. My only concern, I, I, th I like the idea of streamlining. It's obviously been well thought through. Um, my only concern is I'd like to see some place in the process for general public awareness and input. It doesn't have to be through the planning board public hearing process. I wouldn't want to see a special use permit because I think that's cumbersome for the use that you're talking about. But the idea of granting the process to an interested group of citizens working through the planner develop a trail system sounds a little bit too narrow to me. I would like to see some place for the public to get involved. Okay. So <clears throat> I know what you mean. So the idea would be if Bernald Crossing wanted to revamp their trail system and they wanted to include bike trails or what have you, a similar effort, perhaps not as extensive as Abenaki would be deployed. So it's not, you know, we want, to, we want to build a trail, Tava said it was okay, and they go build a trail and then the neighbors lose their minds. That wasn't the idea. The idea was this land is looking at a trail or a network of trails. How are you going to invoke the elements of the Abenaki model, if you will, or Abenaki 2.0 model in designing your trails? And then perhaps there would be an abutter notification process if anyone had any concerns. I think it still has to go through CONCOM. It may need to go through TRC, but the idea would be let's, it, it's really just looking at de-obligating the special use permit for wetland crossings if the, if the research was done ahead of time. This is what we're crossing. That's, this is how we're adapting you know, the buffer crossing or the open water crossing from the Abenaki model, et cetera, and that could move forward. As far as I'm concerned, the de-obligation process is good, and that's where we should start. And then perhaps during the conceptual planning of the whole process, um, some additional I... public input opportunities could be woven in. Sure. Um, I'm a person who has actually uh, been involved in the building of, of a trail across a wetland. And it has to do with how close you are to the um, you know, class one wetland. It has to do with how much dirt you move. And the process through DES is not very complex. And it is pretty straightforward. The only problem that we had in our particular situation 
was that we didn't realize that they didn't send you anything. You had to go check their website to see that you'd been approved. We had to go through the process of saying where it was, what we were doing, and you know, the approval was given without any trouble. And so I think the DES has a system for looking at what is approved and what is not approved, and we may just not need to be involved. But we do, because right now the Wetland Conservation Overlay District says that walk, foot, walking paths and footbridges in wetland areas require a special use permit. So where I'm going is invoke the DES process, let the abutters know what's going on, have CONCOM and or TRC or some variant of that look at it, and if all of those I's are dotted and T's are crossed, enjoy your trail. And, and some um, supervision of the kind of construction proposed, because you can drive, you know, a big tractor in there and dig a hole and put cement in it, or you can those, get some helical piers and do yeah. it more gently. And those are the details. I guess I'll print this out for the workshop so people have time to review you it. You could send it as, a, as an email, as an attachment, and we could look at it before that time without printing it all out. I would, you know, save trees. Happy to. That's all I had on that. Interesting idea. Uh, okay, well, I, I mean, I know there are being trails contemplated all over town. Yes. And so, you know, I, I just think they all need to be treated the same. Correct. And they all need to connect. That's the big deal. They need to connect. I, oh, uh, I would uh, welcome the trail system. There's a lot of people out there that would use it. It would uh, spread the con, uh, the density away a little bit, it would sp spread the compaction out a little bit more and allow uh, everybody to space out a little bit more, but it's a great effort, whoever's uh, pushing to get those drawings like that. Okay. Okay. It is interesting that the rail trail is not connected to some of the snowmobile trails because the connection is over Lake Wentworth, and Lake Wentworth needs to be frozen enough so that you can drive your snowmobile. So it's, uh, there is not that connection during the, the uh, uh, summer months, because, well, you could go, sw you could go swim. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're gonna see this again? Is that what you're indicating to us? I'll put something on the work session. I will email out the presentation that we just went through to the board. I'll put it on the work session. My recommendation is to put it to the end because I'd rather focus on the more pressing issues of zoning language and those amendments. And we can bump it if needs to be. It, planning board not getting to it in September is not going to slow down the Abenaki process. This does not have to go to public hearing. We don't have to put this on the warrant. This is an internal thing for us to discuss see how far that they can go with it. It sounds like the concept is generally acceptable, but we need some more details, and that may not be ready in two weeks. Okay, all right. Okay, why don't we go back up to the top of the item public meetings. And uh, the first item on, on uh, that list is drive-through memos from um, uh, Paul Zimmerman. So, anybody have any thoughts about? Yeah, I had a thought about this. And that's this. Um, he says here in his fourth paragraph, I would like to encourage the planning board to have a broader vision of the community, to make intelligent decisions on the facts and reality. Okay. I would like to challenge Mr. Zimmerman, to tell us exactly what he would like to do. He seems to be the proponent for a drive through restaurant in Wolfboro. I'd like to see, hear from him if he wants to. Tell us exactly what it is that he would like to do. Uh, it's pretty clear. <laughs> pretty clear. Well, it's, it's I, actually well, not pretty clear. That's I think we've thing. given him enough time 
Pardon? I think we've given him enough time. He's taken up our time many times. I know a lot of people feel that way. Every single person who was here, I shouldn't say that, many of the people who were here at that forum said exactly that. He's had two bites of the apple. He shouldn't get a third. We're wasting our time, blah, blah. So, so I guess my thought He's would be, turn. Did, did anyone on the board read anything in this letter that changes your opinion of the recommendations that came out of the last work session? And if not, we just add this to the file and um, move on. I would actually say yes, because his statement, most of these people would prefer little camps along the lake with no water, electricity, and outhouses. And I would say that that is a patently absurd statement. <laughs> That is not what anybody wants on our lake shores. And so I don't believe that much of what he's writing is correct. And so I, you know, it, it enforces my previous opinion. Okay. That particular sentence when I read it was just like, what are you saying? No, we don't want to go there. He's just, just taking up more of your time. That's all just, he's doing. It's just hyperbole. So, ma Madam Chairman, unless, unless the board wants to reconsider the definitions that were discussed at the last meeting. I think you've done the service. Uh, well, uh, I don't, but I don't know how the rest of the board feels. I mean, we did talk about this at the last meeting and and uh, dealt with it. Did anybody feel differently? I mean, one, one of the things that he brought up was the new restaurant out on Route 28. I mean, that his proposal wasn't even covering that. So, uh, any, anyway, oh. I, I, I think if he, if he wants this type of establishment, there are processes that he can go through to uh, bring it to the public, to public bodies, the ZBA and the planning board. Any other? Okay, all right, the next issue is the library. Uh, we are considered the stakeholders, or a stakeholder for the library landscape um, uh, committee, and so we've been invited to a meeting. We are uh, considered a stakeholder? What? We are a stakeholder? Yes, we are. Are we? Uh, because we reviewed the project with the library. And that so, makes us a stakeholder. Yes. Oh, okay. And so th this is just a, a, a friendly, if you're interested in coming to attend the stakeholders meeting, the meeting on September 8th at 1.30. So. I'm a little unhappy that it's at 1.30 in the afternoon in the middle of the week. Just saying that out loud. Okay, well, there will be other, there will be other meetings. There, there's a, another meeting coming up uh, right after that, and tear away. Uh, you know, so there are other opportunities. Okay, um, Taibon letter, Brewster Condo. You may remember back in February, I put together a memo to the board asking for a release of a performance bond for the condo building. And there was a lot of discussion about whether Kai Bond had done the appropriate inspections. The short answer, and it's summarized in this letter, is no. Uh, Brewster never called Tai Bond. They went through the full construction cycle, and Tai Bond did none of the required or requisite inspections as part of that contract. Um, that said, um, really don't have the ability to have Brewster go undo everything that Ty Bond would have looked at. So instead, I called Ty Bond and asked that they come do a final inspection of the as-built condition, and this top memo from them evidenced what they found. Um, effect, short answer, substantial conformance with the plans. Um, so no concern with how it was done, how it was planted, how it's been operating. Um, the actual date of the inspection was uh, middle of July, I think you remember how wet it was heading to that point, and everything seemed to be serviced just fine. Um, what I will bring back to the board, uh, perhaps even at the work session, is a revised request to have that money returned to uh, Brewster Academy to close out that performance line. 
the reason I don't have it now is we haven't processed the invoice from Tai Bond for this memo, so I don't know what value to put in front of you. However, if the board is willing to recall return of those funds and make a motion to approve return of said funds minus the expense of this inspection, I'm happy to accept that as well and just move forward. Okay, so you're saying you want a motion to that effect? If, if the board is comfortable, I can do that or I can bring back a, a, a memo with a corrected amount to release that bond. Okay, well, uh, they said that it seems to be working okay when, he, when they went over in July. Correct. Um, John, I, I think you brought this up uh, the last time we talked about it. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I had brought up the, uh, the integrity of the product that we were asking our applicants to use and, and how they were uh, finishing off the areas and, and how we would like to see the areas finished off. And uh, obviously, you look at that area down there and it's, uh, if I was the neighbor across the street and I was looking at that jungle, I would ask the, where the town was and what their uh, uh, regulations were. So I think that uh, I had a conversation with Tavis and we worked some of this into the stormwater regulations on uh, what our expectations are for grass and uh, the swales and the finish off areas and and uh, moving forward uh, we're, we are in a better position if we craft those into our stormwater regulations but as as far as it is right now um, uh, what you see is what you get to, to if, if I may to only to a point John I'm troubled by the second paragraph of the letter because it seems to me that what the applicant Brewster Academy pledged to do, it didn't do. And to the point that Ty Bond actually says, it's their understanding the applicant never contacted them to do what they said they were going to do three different times. And. Uh, if I have their money to hold their feet to the fire, I would like to say to them, how do you respond to the fact that you did not do what you said you were going to do? And what are you going to do in the future to, so that if you say again to us, I'm going to do it, that we have any reason to necessarily believe that you're going to do it? I felt a little troubled by that. Well, I, I'm not sure. Not sure. I have no idea. I, I don't know who was sitting in what chair at the time this was evolving, but it seems to have been evolving during the time when there was a bit of turnover. Um, since coming here, I've learned a number of things, or not related to this specifically, that the shoreland, per, the town shoreland permit that the planner signs off on is accompanied by a plan. Only recently did I learn that that plan does not then become part of the building permit submittal. So the code enforcement officer doesn't ne didn't necessarily know what the shoreland permit showed. So there was a disconnect. But in this case, by, by extension, I think there's been a long-term disconnect between what the planning board reviewed and what was submitted to the building official for building permits. Moreover, there's nothing in the building permit inspection schedule that says when do I look at the detention pond. Am I, am I supposed to know that Ty Bond is supposed to be contacted? So there's as much burden on the town as there is on Brewster. In this case, the way the letter is written by Ty Bond, Ty Bond understood that, the, that Brewster was to contact Ty Bond. Correct. Ty Bond was not contacted. Correct. That's what concerns me, because Ty Bond is the engineer that's over, supposedly overseeing creation of the stormwater management system that this board approved. Correct. And, and the double did, check on that system is And they did my not office. do that. And Correct. that is what concerns me. And I'd, I would like to have Brewster made aware of this issue, if it is indeed an issue. I, all I have is Ty Bond's letter. I'm assuming it's in good faith and it's telling me the truth. I would like Brewster to be aware of the fact that there appears to be a failure in oversight here and that, at least as according to our engineer, failure was on the side of the applicant not to contact the engineer 
engineer believed that the applicant was supposed to contact the Correct. engineer. Because so after Correct the last time, after the last time, the planning board, when I brought the memo, the planning board said, "Well, did the third party engineer sign off?" I called Ty Bond, and they were pulling their hair out looking for inspection reports or dates or Outlook calendars or what have you. They didn't exist. That's the basis of that letter. They can find no record of being contacted or any inspections being done. I'd like to know why. Don't, don't, shouldn't this board be concerned that if we say to an applicant, work with the engineer to make sure the engineer is satisfied that you are doing what this board wants you to do, and the engineer is never contacted by the applicant, shouldn't this board be concerned? Well, the board should be concerned, but the board should be equally concerned, not in someone's inaction, but multiple people's inaction. The fact that the, the work was done, the site work was done, and the town never knew to double check itself. But I'm not dealing with the town's putative failure to inspect in this case. This is the way the performance contracts are signed. The applicant is to contact the third party. This is the way they've all been done. Okay, fine. In this case, I'm talking only about the, the applicant contacting the engineer. Correct. The so, outcome is perfectly fine. The system worked perfectly well, even in a month of very high rainfall. So we know it was done correctly. Correct. But if I were running a business and my client told me that my inspector was never contacted, and we didn't do what he said he was going to do, I would be concerned. And I would like to get a comment back from the client. So my thought is that the remedy would be when we approve, uh, let's say, three visits or whatever it is, a note has to go to the building department saying, you know, propose, you know, not just when they backfilled the foundation, but three visits, something like that. So he's there aware. It, many of them now are actually coming up with a construction schedule, so they know when they're going to be at what phase, and we can stage out. Those so we're closing the door after the horse is bolted. This Correct. horse is That's bolted. That's what we're here for. No, what, what what I'm here for right now is just is to to find out what I can. What I'm concerned about is how much confidence can I have in assurances given to me by an applicant that something is going to be done, but it's actually going to get done. That, that, that is the code enforcement side of the building in, and code. In this case. Yep, yeah, but we have to make sure they're doing it. We are the that's double a, check. That, but, but Tavis, I, I don't, I'm not going to, I don't mean to be argumentative, and if the board feels I'm taking too much time, tell me and I'll shut up. In this case, there's no place for the code enforcement officer to the building permit process to become involved in this case. In this case, it was between the applicant and Ty Bond. The applicant made an undertaking. Ty Bond expected it to be taken care of, and it was not. That is what concerns me. Whether it fit into the process, it also failed. That's a bigger picture, but well, it's not of interest to me. So well, well it, it, it is. I mean, I understand where you're going, or where you're going with that, but at the same time, it's that standard condition. The most restrictive of the, with, within the file is the controlling element. The regulations are part and parcel of all approvals. What do you propose in this case, then, to give them, give them their $2,000 back? In, in this case, the horse is out of the barn. And, and we just forget about it. No, no well, we have to fix the fence. We're going to have to fix the fence so that it doesn't come out of the barn again. Correct. But, but again, this, this horse we're going to let run wild. This but, horse showed us that we needed to fix the fence. Couldn't we That's just send this I, letter to Brewster and say we're concerned about it? That's exactly what I asked for. I, well, I would we, make a motion that we end up sending Brewster a letter that, according to their uh, plan, they were supposed to consult with the uh, engineers a number of times, and they didn't, although the end result seemed to be appropriate. Well, um, take, the even sweetener out. take the sweetener out and just leave it as a bold statement. You were supposed to do X, you didn't do it. Here's a letter that suggests that you didn't do it. Please comment to, to the planning board, yours truly. That's what I would do. Well, I have a question. Peter, uh, was that a motion? I have my motion, and I would say that, um, in fact, what the planning board really is interested in is the end result. We should note that the process wasn't done correctly, but the end result is correct. And so, therefore, we should end up saying that, yes, the end result is correct. And yeah, so I would say that the sweetener is okay. 
that even we are, though we are reprimanding them for not doing what they should they said they were going to do that's the kind of reprimand i would always like to have gotten well back they actually the did exactly what they said they were going to do oh, okay. before calling the engineer correct um who installed all this stuff their contractor and that contractor should have some records as to we installed this I'm stuff. not trying to beat this like the dead horse that came out of the barn, but what are we going to get out of sending this letter to Brewster? They're going to say, we're sorry, we, o we overlooked that. I'm, I do not, I frankly would not expect to get a reply. I'm okay, not, look, so I'm not it, looking for- It's a for, fun exercise. I'm just no, it's not even a fun exercise. It is simply an indication to the applicant that this board is not asleep and this board does care when horses run out of the barn. So what we could do, we're pissed off that the barn door closed, we can ask them for proof of what they installed. Well, we see that in pictures and we know it works. Is that All we're seeing is grass here. We're not seeing anything down in. Well, the, Most the, installers now take photos of what they've done. We can ask for well, that. The, what this bond's letter says it works. With, so what, I, this, I, what this memo suggests to me is that they built it per plan based on what could be seen in the after condition. Suggested, yeah, right, absolutely. but we don't know what's in there. Well, we know what's in the plan because the board approved it. Right. And then Ty Bond to suggest, I but mean, I they had the whole plan set before the site walk and they came out and said, okay, they did it. Yeah. But and it I mean, works. a little bit of proof along the way, like Mike wants a letter written, you can say, and we would like a little proof of what was actually done, sent to uh, us for your file. And, uh, and, and then we'll release your money. So that, <clears throat> that's where I can step in because. That's what we asked the first time when they wanted their money back. <clears throat> and I said, what's the integrity of the work that they performed? And had there been an inspection? Because before Tavis got here, our former planner had this in the fall. His codes officer was headed out the door also. So there was no codes officer to uh, transfer continuity to the new planner. And therefore, the situation lapsed. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that Brewster Academy would, would uh, not do the uh, call to the engineers, uh, allow their uh, people to move in, and just kind of let it slide by mm -hmm. without uh, being up front with the town. I mean, they're going to have many more projects. They don't understand yeah. that we're going to be thinking about them next time. Yeah, uh, right. so, uh, so this really all came down to whether or not the grass was the proper uh, function material for the site. And that's so back to Julie's. Uh, it's, it was majorly a swaled area with uh, different soil profiles of different uh, materials. I don't see uh, uh, any intricate chambered systems or anything of that nature so i'm not really worried with that aspect it, it's a it's a it's the finished product that causes me the most consternation and that's where we want to be on top of it down the road and that's where when i talked to tavis and we and had a stormwater committee with with getting that in there because right now they basically wrote us a letter back and said there's no uh qualifications for any of this a finished product it's just for the substance and that's the swale area so it's all there it just looks uh, looks like it will function and uh, but Brewster Academy should be put on notice for sure right yeah, that's I mean, why I, I think it, we really should send this letter to in, them. In, in the interest of collegiality I will second Peter's motion because it hasn't gotten a second yet thank right, you right Yes, he, he did not get a second. I call a question. He did not get a second. I call the question. Okay, would you mind repeating your, your motion, please? The motion is to suggest that the Brewster, write a letter to Brewster Academy saying that they did not fulfill the obligations set forth by inspections with their engineers, but the end result is uh, what was expected. Is it okay if this letter goes yeah, we include a copy with, of the letter. With that? Yes. Because I really think that they need to see this. Yep. Yes. Yeah, okay. All right. And so... Um, I'll re-second that motion. Okay. Uh, Peter has made the motion. Mike has seconded it. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed?
Okay. All right. So, if, um, if you could, am, one, I, am I adding a please respond? I mean, I can write them yes, a letter. Sure. Please, please, please respond. Put a re please respond. One. One other thing a, I'm going to suggest. Okay. Give us a follow up. Thank you, Peter. One other thing I'm going to suggest is that um, you know this place does not quite look like a mowed grass field. Uh, at the same time, this is. Uh, what in many ways our nature should look like, as in there are uh, a mowed glass fi grass field is basically a ecological desert. A desert. Nothing grows there other than grass, and uh, so therefore what is in those swales is perhaps better than uh, a mowed field. You're here. Okay. All right, so we got that issue resolved. Um, okay, the uh, 2022 planning board meeting scheduled. Any issues we need to be aware of with that, Tavis? Gosh, I thought I was gonna do something. Here. Are there any issues? No, I think this is just provided for information if any board members have any conflicts or if there become a number of conflicts from board members and we need to look at rescheduling, but we're doing this this early to make sure we can secure the room but you'll get feedback. And, and November all. 1 is not an election day? We, I will look into that. That would be the only issue. Mm, there's some oh, okay, there is all, the, all uh, right. The Patty Cook's letter, we've hearing. talked about that. Uh, the Master Plan Implementation Committee. I touched base with Peter just before the meeting opened, and I will have an update for the committee, at the, for the board at the next meeting. Okay, great. Uh, Taylor Home concept review. So there's currently, uh, or was recently a TRC application for a new structure um, at Taylor Homes on Bay Street. This is not the one that just received site plan approval, but this is a new structure uh, that will likely be coming forward um, in short order. What it did was bring to staff's attention perhaps a deficiency in the Wetland Overlay Conservation District language. Um, and let's say when an area of disturbance becomes the existing condition and or if an area previously disturbed is to be redisturbed, does it need to come back for a special permit review by the planning board or is it already cats out of the bag, if you will? Um, it's interesting in this particular case when the disturbance was soil as opposed to a structure. So the existing Taylor home community, if you pull in off of Bay Street and then turn to the right, the original phase four of that development contemplated six or eight cottages. So the road is in, the water and sewer is in, the electrical's into the box and all of the grass, if you will, or the grass area around the potential cottages is already there. When they started planning the new structure, they started paying close, very close attention to the prime wetland buffer and the other um, poorly drained soil buffer. And the question was raised, do we need a special use permit because we're going into an area that's already been disturbed? And the ordinance is largely silent on that. So I had to think rather pragmatically about it. If all of the structures were there, hypothetically, there could be a cottage 10 feet inside the 100 foot or prime wetland buffer and we could do nothing about it and they would be able to keep that structure in that location in perpetuity. They couldn't necessarily expand it or otherwise. Oh, and there's the key. So as long as you stay within your limit of disturbance and you don't expand it, the way the ordinance seems to read is that it doesn't need a new special use permit. And I just wanted the board to think about that, perhaps for revisions to wetland conservation in upcoming years, just to clarify that point. Um, now, the, the benefit, as I see it, in this particular case, and as would likely be the case in all such similar cases moving forward, is that the provo proposed development has to be in compliance with today's regulations, kind of goes without saying, but in the 1990s when this fill slope went in there, there was not a lot of stormwater management being contemplated. 
all the water that came off the road went past the houses and went down into the wetland. What's being proposed in this particular case, and you'll have more details at site plan review, obviously, is a, a care facility that will capture all of its runoff, both from the road, the parking lot, the roofs, and it's providing a 2021 era retention system so that all the water, all the stormwater on the site is getting treated before going into the wetlands. So it's really the, the, the best of everything, but I just wanted to be, this isn't something you need to act on, this is something to think about. I, I wouldn't think in any condition, even if it's disturbed, you could put a structure within 25 feet of a wetland that's been designated. That's the interesting thing. The board approved it. It's an approved site plan that shows structures and grading and not necessarily residential structures, but stormwater structures, embankments, things of that sort, and it's on the as-built plan. There's, in this particular case, a 16-inch corrugated metal pipe that runs about 30 feet into the wetland, and that's as the board approved it, and that's as it was built. What year was it approved? 90s-ish. Don't quote me on that, public. Well, uh, so it effectively it, it equates fill slope or a disturbed site as an existing nonconformity. And it can't be increased, but it also can't be negated. Its existence can't be ignored. That's why uh, over the years people have come to us with applications so that they can do their work. They don't have a timeline, but they have a, a site plan. Mm -hmm. So right. unfortunately, I, I understand the, the, the dilemma, but uh, there's, no, there's no sunsetting when people's applicant, applications go bad and they have to... Well, there, there is the opportunity. If, if a site plan did not vest or if it was not substantially completed, the board wouldn't have to honor that approved site plan. Somebody had a plan, it sat on a shelf, 20 years later the economy flips and they decide to move forward with that plan. That doesn't work. The difference here is it was a four-phase four plan that the board approved and three and a half phases are in and built. We cannot go back on that fourth phase. But instead of eight cottages, it's going to be this structure and the question was, is that covered by the level of disturbance? And I think the board would have a hard argument suggesting that. I think course. the question would come would, would be the infrastructure because that's where we would hold the bond for any infrastructure and, and that would be the only thing that we would really be concerned about. Correct, but in this case, it's all private infrastructure and private roads. Anyway, something to think about. Let me know if you have questions going forward. Good. Okay, and when is this coming to us? When they submit. Oh. Uh, currently, the, I don't mean to be quip. They haven't submitted yet, so I don't have a timeline. Oh. Uh, oh. It will be going to the Zoning Board of Adjustment uh, later this month because uh, the structure they're proposing exceeds the height limit. So they'll be looking for a variance for that. Okay, uh, all right. Uh, the issue for 399 uh, Pleasant Valley Road was on here because the um, the applicant got a, a variance in order to then reduce lot then, frontage on one lot yeah yeah right and I just wanted to make sure that they knew that they had to come in for uh, to the planning board so okay the uh, law review you sent that out uh, yeah. people would have gotten it today was it today Law review? What? Didn't this go to everybody? I believe you sent that to everybody, yes. I sent out another email. Is that on the uh, agenda? No, but I was just have it here. Oh, okay. Can that you repeat what you time. said? The what review? What? What did you say? The what review? It's the uh, 2021 Land Use Law Conference. Oh. And I got it in my email, so I figured everybody else did. I think you sent it to everyone, yes. I, haven't had I a sent a version of it out today. Yeah. Okay, so if anybody is interested in going, uh, does the town pick up the cost of this? Uh, portions of it, yes. Just let me know if you're interested and we'll sort that out. 
Th this, I think this is a full day virtual conference. Yes. Correct. Not, we're not going then. <laughs> what? We're not going then. No, but there may be a charge. No, I oh, yeah. to be available yeah. to watch it. Yeah. Yeah, right. Is that that one where you can um, download it later? Is that that one? I'm sure it will be recorded for viewing, yes. Download all the PowerPoint presentations they make. I'm not oh, sure about not the, the actual whole video. I'm not sure about the actual video or the verbal part of it. Huh. But all of the PowerPoints you can. It's well worth doing if you haven't yeah. done. Especially for really, planning. Really Isn't is. that during the week? Isn't that another one that's during the week? No, it's uh, this is a Saturday. Oh. Nine to four. Um, can I ask the planner for the, for our next work session to give us a list of all the measures that need a public hearing and that we're going towards warrant for? So we kind of have a list of what we're going to be working towards because I'm not altogether sure I know of all of them. My, my hope and goal is to come to the next work session with everything in the format ready to go to public hearing so it just becomes... Okay. Thank you, Tavis. Okay, uh, just w one other item. Um, Susan Replier and I went to the police commission meeting on August 19th. Um, uh, we were f uh, asked to go by the, this, this board. Uh, we were asked to go to the board of selectmen, but the, the selectmen said that they don't have anything to do with uh, police issues. Uh, so that's how we ended up at the police commission. Uh, we told them that we were hearing uh, a lot of concerns about noise and wanted to make sure that these were following up, that some of the people that had complained said it was affecting the quality of life in their neighborhood. Uh, and then the uh, chief went through how he does follow up on noise complaints. Um, he, he said that there really have only been three or four that they have followed up on. Uh, we then asked him if there are repeated offenses, uh, what he called the property owners, uh, to make them aware of the situation. He said, no, that really was not uh, within their uh, jurisdiction, but then he did go on to say that, yes, he, he certainly would do that if this was a situation that warranted it. He uh, then went on to say that uh, the neighborhood associations have more teeth to deal with these issues, and he told us about the licensing, licensing of golf carts um, at Port Wadeland and how they the property owners got all of that done and uh, said that he really thought that that in in many cases it would be easier if the neighborhood associations got involved in noise complaints so so anyway that's the issue and we did talk about uh, could you increase fines and he said that comes back to uh, the board of selectmen to Establish the fines. So, anyway, that's my report. Um, I think one of the issues with having the neighborhood associations deal with these kind of issue is that some are stronger than others. So, if they're going to deal with them, they may have to become stronger. Okay, and then one other item I had put on the agenda was an up update on the. Um, the housing opportunity zones. Um, I believe where we left that was for uh, me to work with town council on coming up with language to come back to the work session. Okay, so so that's moving. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. I think the idea is to, to get some language from council as to how we can craft a warrant article to authorize housing opportunity zones. What this board has to, has yet to describe discuss where we want to declare housing opportunity zones to exist in this town. I think the original proposal was everywhere but the shorefront residential district. And I don't think we got much further than this, that bold statement. It needs right. to be discussed. And then the board needs to feel comfortable with making a recommendation to go on to the Warren article. That's where we stand now. Can I make a, can I kind of back up on the, um, 
your report, your meeting with Susan and the uh, WPD commission. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like the, the police have limited ability to make changes on the ground in response to unruly short-term rentals. It sounds like the selectmen could increase fines if they thought that was appropriate for infractions, but it seems that there's nothing really solid that's being proposed anywhere to deal with any potential problems regarding short-term rentals. Well, and it may be that the selectmen need to put together a, 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 sorry, a subcommittee to look at revisions to the noise ordinance. Well, the... And then the, the fines would be graded, you know, prorated, graded out based on level of offenses based on uh, a revamped noise ordinance. This but board, it all still hinges on somebody calling saying something's loud, come look. Oh, un understood. Um, what I'm just getting at is this board set up a subcommittee, held public meetings, listened to input, came up with some recommendations. The recommendation was to speak to the selectmen, speak to the Wolfboro Police Department Commission. Those things have been done. What's the next step? Um, maybe it's on the... I maybe. Mean the uh, according to what the chief said, is that they've just had, um, you know, three or four complaints. And... I, you know, I think where Mike might be going, and I know he will correct me if I err, is there any reason for the short-term rental committee to continue meeting, having the recommendations therefrom be vetted by police commission and selectmen. I think that I'd, I'd make a proposal, I'd, I'd make, a, make a motion to disband the short-term rental subcommittee at this point. I think it's, it's fulfilled its, its remit, done what it's supposed to have done. I think this board has done what it said it ought to do regarding short-term rentals. There may or may not be a problem. I think the ball now lies in the hands of the executive in the town. They have to decide whether or not they feel there's a problem that needs to be responded to. As far as we're concerned, I think we should yeah. disband our subcommittee. Well, um, uh, if we could, if, if you wouldn't mind holding that, uh, because sure. we, do, we do have um, another meeting in a couple of weeks, and you were going to get us some information from other communities about short-term rentals. He seems not to have remembered that. I'm happy to. That would be fine. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, you know, so that's how we kind of left it. And I will withdraw that motion. Well, I mean, yes, that's where the short-term rental committee asked for more information for another meeting. What I'm still trying to figure out is the short-term rental committee coming up with new ways to re-ask the planning board, what do you want to do about short-term rentals this year? <laughs> well, the answer is we're not doing anything this year, at least as I understand from the planning board. So, so meet one more time and then we'll disband. Yeah, right. That's That was sort of my thought. Meet one more time, disband it, and... Pass the ball to the executive. I have just one question. It just in this whole thing. Has anybody heard what's been going on in North Conway? I remember a couple of months ago they were going to Superior Court or something. Has anything come about that or has that come up or...? They're still going to Superior Court. They're just like in line waiting. Superior Court had a backlog of 18 months. Oh, well, okay. So what I, I understand things. about the case in North Conway is that the uh, the town itself has taken the position of going after one individual, and they present their information to the judge to make sure that the information is correct before they can move their information to the individual that they're going after. So they're, they're covering their bases on the uh, procedural end and they're walking it slowly and they're allowing the short-term rentals 
that, that are existing to continue. Uh, and that's that. So as far as what the short-term rental committee left was, uh, the, the law, law, laws and the status of the short-term rental decisions and case law is it may, mainly revolves around the transient uh, housing wording, and that was the working stiffs case in Portsmouth. So the short-term rental committee was looking at other communities that are going proactive to get that into their ordinance wording so that they can uh, protect themselves from the transient housing situation. And that falls under the short-term category by that use definition. So our request to Tavis was to look at our other communities and see how they're developing their short-term rental uh, use ordinances and how they're making them work or they're restricting them. That's, I believe, how we left it. Right. Yeah, but, but th thus far, the short-term rental committee has, we've talked about grandfathering, that if people have been using their properties for short-term rentals, they can continue. Uh, Tavis has told us that we really do not have the capacity to enforce this because we've talked about various in enforcement, uh, well, let me just finish, no. um, issues, and it requires, you know, getting a list of everybody, going after people, and uh, that's, that's kind of a, that's just a, a new arm of, of government that we're, we're talking about. The, uh, we have a, a legal opinion from our attorney saying that there is nothing wrong with a private property owner renting their property, that that is within their rights as a private property owner. Uh, as far as the adding of the, the transient, you know, that probably I think would be a good idea, John, but when we brought it back to this board, uh, uh, no one seemed to be interested in it, so you know that's kind of kind of where, where we are. I think the, the the board agreed with the argument, given the unsettled legal status of short-term rentals, both on the municipal and the statewide basis. It's smarter for us to let other parties spill their blood in battle, and then wait to see who comes out ahead and then craft, if necessary, any regulations to fit the new circumstances. And if we don't have to, we'll leave them the way they are. The legal opinion that we got, we are not obligated to take as if it were the word of the deity. The legal opinion, you can probably find as many legal opinions as you want by rounding up a bunch of different lawyers, put them all in the same room. Um, well, I'm just telling I, I you just, that that's what we got, so. That's perfectly fine. I've had legal opinions of all sorts on yeah, the same yeah, issue. Okay, well, it was from and our And I'm not arguing so with you, Madam Chair. I thought it was important to bring I'm not up. arguing with you, Madam Chairwoman. No, I, I'm well, simply stating an opinion that we. You're talking louder than I am. Okay, I'll, I'll beg your pardon. I'll lower my voice. We are not obligated to take a legal opinion, even if it is from our official counsel if we feel that it is not appropriate to the circumstance that we're dealing with on the ground. Okay, well, where we, we are now is that, you know, I think the smart thing to do is disband till we find out what happens in, in Conway and then pick it up from, from there. And Tavis, you wanted to say something. I'm all set, thank you. It was, ad it was addressed. I have nothing to add at this time. Yeah, okay, all right. I think, Kathy, it may end up being the situation is decided in other places in New Hampshire other than Conway, so it wouldn't necessarily be Conway's yeah. decision. Yeah, right. But, you know, we're, we're looking for other people to, right. Right. to deal with it. Yes. Okay, uh, anything uh, else? Uh, and, I've, got, uh, I've got one. Uh, yeah, okay. Two, two things that are on my thought radar here. Uh, as of lately, I don't know if anybody's gone down by the Dunkin' Donuts. There was a lot of uh, 
backing up into the street on on uh, Center Street this summer with long lines and and uh, they resurfaced their parking lot and then uh, the traffic used to go in on the high side of Center Street and it looks as though now that they've uh, painted a second line for you to come out that entrance also. Can we, can we investigate Tavis and the uh, Yes, and I remember the, and something the plan about that. When that was approved, I don't believe, I remember watching that on, and uh, specifically that they were concerned with the uh, stacking and uh, people coming down the hill and having to stop for cars that were turning yeah, remember out of something, that. Yeah, something to do with the wetlands that was there with the exit that I, they had to go that I, way because they couldn't come back up. I, I don't remember know. That? I don't know whether or not it was the radius of the turning or the safety factor. Mm. Or, I'm happy to look at the approved site plan and yeah. driveway okay, permit and see what is. And the and the other issue is the uh, uh, feather flare fa flags that have been popping up all over the place. Do we need to uh, relook at our sign situation to figure out? Uh, and, and relook at what's permitted and say, uh, I know we went and asked some of these places that were flying them to not fly them. Uh, then they're coming back up. They're coming back up on the weekends. I know we've thoroughly bantered this back mm -hmm. when Matt was here. And uh, it seems uh, it's a lost issue right now. The, the, uh, I'd like to get a grip on the situation to say they're, they're good to go or they're not going. One or the other. Well, the, the short answer is the feather flag term does not exist in the ordinance anymore. So any such feather flag or similar such element um, would require a sign permit as a freestanding sign. So any, the only violation at this point would be existence of a freestanding sign without a sign permit. So it's a very time consuming process. You can put the letter out. They learn that they're not in compliance. You wait until 30 days. They become in compliance by removing said feather sign and then reinserting said feather sign on day 32. It's it's a, we have we have precedent though on what we were asking our uh, offenders to do within the reason that we sent uh, letters out. Can yeah, we? The, the compliance is to come at, the compliance request is to either obtain a permit or remove the sign. They know they can't get a sign permit without a variance, so they remove the sign and then they I, reinstall the sign. Well, I think you're you're talking about an approval of a of a permitted sign. I I don't. I'm under the impression that they're not a permitted sign. You can't, inst you can't put temporary freestanding signs on your property. We don't account for the temporary, other than the, the odd nuances in the ordinance that allow the sandwich board signs all over the sidewalk. So maybe it is time to re reconvene the sign Coming committee. Coming up in, in the spring, you know, hopefully all this COVID crap's gonna be down some. I think it might be a good idea to remind a lot of people about things that have just been let slide and say, remember, we can't do that anymore. Remember that? You can't put those outside. Well, inter interest, I mean, yes, I'm happy to put together something that says, hey, have a business in town. Remember, you can do oh. this, you can't do that. Frankly, the only people yeah. complaining are coming from this room. Could be. So if it, it, there's it not be. a broad base, you know, this business is upset that that business is doing it or that resident doesn't like driving through the well, neighborhood Well, because we anymore. went up. He put one out. I'm going to put one up. It's one of those. But it might not be a bad thing to think about, oh, maybe we should just have an article in the paper come in this spring, remind people, say, hey, it's spring. Do you remember it's time to bring in and then put out, you know, like, you know, time to bring in your bird feeders. Oh, when you put those signs out that aren't approved. Okay. Yeah, and as far as uh, complaints coming from this room, we are out in the community, and people do speak to us about these things. Oh no, I wasn't. So that's that's why some of these complaints are coming from this room. I understand. What I'm telling you is that there's not. Pup I am only hearing it from this room, and it is not clear when this room speaks if it's coming from representatives of the public or not. Well, I, I'm telling you. And from yes, my you point are in fact view, representatives is. of the community. I'm not belittling the complaints. What I'm saying is, there are many complaints that come in because so and so is working on their car, so and so is doing this without a permit, and those co permits come in right frequently. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, what, the uh, no public comments. Uh, the review of August seventeenth. Minutes. 
You may have any issues with that. Move to approve. Okay, uh, Vaughn, you were not at that meeting. Abstain. Yeah, okay, but uh, you're listed as... Um, yes, you're you right. look down as, below that. As being, says, being yeah. there, so if we could just cross uh, Vaughn off the present list uh, because she wasn't here and... And if I, you go I down know, a line, you'll see that I'm absent. <coughs> what? If you go down a line, you'll see that I'm absent. Member's absent. It, <laughs> but you were there. I'm a member <laughs> still, but I wasn't there. Uh, okay, and it, it, as far as the, the minutes are concerned, I, I know that I have been saying to Julie, could, could you sit? Uh, because we... Yes, that should be added to the minutes. Yeah, right. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, Motion. Did you make a motion? I did. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve as amended. Okay. Second. Second. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. And Peter Goodwin, I am very sorry. I do have these little lapses. It's getting better though. <laughs> oh. um, <laughs> other, it, as you're out. You as you're out spending time speaking with friends and colleagues around town, we are advertising for someone to do the minutes. Um, Leanne Hendrickson has volunteered to do the zoning board and planning board through the month of September. Um, she is doing them even though she's not here. She's watching and enjoying herself at home with minutes. Um, so we really need to find people. Keep in mind the town has been looking for a part-time person to do minutes for several months and there's not much appetite in the local community for part-time minute responsibilities. If someone that's staff orientated would actually put that on a town Facebook thing, I'm really willing to share it. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh -huh.